Okay, I like this figure because it um, it's a way, it's a different way of looking at it. We're using changes in blood flow to help understand a reduced ability to perform. So instead of thinking of a uh, heart rate and, and temperature going up, we're, we're looking at how blood's normally distributed um, throughout the body and then how that might impact the ability to perform. So the big difference between these two figures is shown at the top. <clears throat> this summarizes essentially some of the changes in that last uh, schematic. 25 degree neutral environment on the left, 43 degree hot environment on the right. And this shows of the total cardiac output required for a given intensity, how it's distributed. So the top of each of these figures is cardiac output in liters per minute. And then the, uh, the gradients or the differences within each layer or, or each of these layers show where that cardiac output goes, either to muscle, the viscera, meaning the internal organs, um, the heart and the brain, uh, or the skin to help cool the body. So during exercise, Muscle sets the demand. That's another um, saying that I picked up in my, in my graduate degree. Muscle sets the demand. Muscle sets the demand means the intensity dictates ventilation. The intensity dictates heart rate. The intensity dictates blood flow. Muscle sets the demand. And so exercise in a neutral environment and uh, similar exercise or doing that same exercise in the heat, you'd expect that the demand for muscle would be the same. If it's the same exercise, demand should be the same. That is, the size and shape of these muscle areas should be similar. We want them to be similar. You can see they're not, and we're going to look at why. So muscle is the largest consumer of cardiac output during normal exercise conditions. Muscle sets the demand. And then we see as exercise increases, there's really only muscle that accounts for that increase. There's a little bit of a widening in the neutral environment of skin blood flow. Um, it's pretty stable to the heart and brain, those important organs, which is good. We don't need much more blood to go to the brain, but we certainly don't want it to go down. And we see a little bit of um, the visceral organs, the uh, intestines, the stomach, the kidneys. Some of the blood flow is reduced during exercise, and at high intensities, it's quite low. So that helps us supply the skin, but overall, the increase in cardiac output normally is due to an increase in demand by the muscle. And you can use a trace like this to calculate VO2 max. So if you were doing a progressive exercise test to exhaustion, um, here our exhaustion would be indicative of a maximal heart rate. You could figure out and measure a stroke volume. That would be able to um, you could calculate cardiac output from those two numbers. If you did that right now, you could figure out cardiac output, 21.8 something. And then using some uh, value for extraction of oxygen, that allows you to figure out VO2 max. That equation that I put up a couple slides ago, these are the numbers that you put in. So how is it different in the heat? The obvious difference is in skin blood flow. At rest in the heat, we've seen that skin tends to take a lot of the blood flow. We're trying to cool the body. We're diverting blood to the skin. And there's a large portion going to the blood or going to the skin at rest. Interestingly, as we begin to, uh, to exercise, muscle sets the demand, and the body preferentially chooses muscle over skin. You have to do the work. 
Muscle needs blood to do the work. And so we do as much as we can to supply muscle, and we even start to reduce the amount of blood going to the skin. Now that's bad, and we'll see why that is when we get to the dehydration section. That's, that's probably why uh, temperature uh, increases. Uh, the increase in temperature is exaggerated in the heat. But we, we end up taking some of the blood from the skin to supply the muscle. In this situation, because there's more blood going to the skin and less available for the muscle, we reach our maximal heart rate sooner. Same maximal heart rate, but we reach our maximal heart rate sooner. We reach our maximal heart rate at a lower stroke volume. That means that when we fatigue, cardiac output is lower. And absolutely, the peak here on the right-hand side is lower than the peak at the left. Cardiac output is lower. And you can see the dashed line on this right-hand side is an overlay of the trace in a neutral environment. We see this waning of cardiac output. Cardiac output is lower, and not only that, but our ability to exercise, our capacity, is reduced. We reach a lower VO2 max in the heat. Maximal heart rate reached sooner. Stroke volume is lower, which compromises cardiac output. Extraction is not affected. We still take the same amount of oxygen out of the arterial blood, but simply owing to the fact that stroke volume is lower, our VO2 max is reduced. Cardiac, cardiac output and VO2 max are reduced in the heat. Does this number make sense uh, to you? 16.6 and 16.2, these are mils of oxygen per 100 mils of blood. You've seen numbers like that before. On the arterial side, it's probably close to 20, 21. On the venous side, it's around 4 or 5. And the difference is how much was pulled out of the blood by the muscle. I bring that up because the next point that we talk about is a switch or an increased emphasis of anaerobic metabolism. And more often than not, when people say anaerobic metabolism, they confuse the fact that the processes that are active don't need oxygen and the muscle doesn't have any oxygen. Those are two different ideas. So extraction is the same. We can get the same amount of oxygen out. We're not maximizing the extraction. The muscle is still oxygenated. So that was the primary effect of exercise in the heat. That reduced blood flow compromises and sets off a cascade of factors that results in eventual fatigue reduces cardiac output, reduces VO2 max. We saw how that happened specifically. What else do we observe during exercise in the heat? We observe an increased requirement for substrate level phosphorylation. And that's just me being nitpicky with the wording. You've heard of this as an increased reliance on anaerobic metabolism. This is energy coming from glycolysis or creatine phosphate. But technically, the proper term is substrate level phosphorylation. It differentiates itself from aerobic phosphorylation or oxidative phosphorylation. It's just me being particular with the wording. And so the question then arises, do we rely more on glycolysis 
um, because the muscle is hypoxic. Does the reduced blood flow to the muscle mean the muscle is hypoxic? And we just saw the answer is no, right? Extraction is the same. And not only that, but extraction is not maximal. There's still 4 mils of oxygen per 100 mils of blood that we could tap into if we needed to. We just saw that on the schematic on the last page. So the muscle's not hypoxic, yet we rely more on substrate level phosphorylation for some reason. And I'll show you what that looks like on this slide. I'm not saying that we don't switch or include more glycolytic ATP. We certainly do. It's not because the muscle is hypoxic. It's for some other reason, and I'll get into those reasons later. I don't actually know if we have a good answer for what that reason is, to be honest. So this, um, this figure is a little tricky to interpret at first, but it's really separated in two panels. So you have um, aerobic and anaerobic energy produced, or oxidative versus substrate level phosphorylation. And this is total metabolic rate. Now, the three different columns are three different workloads. So a light workload, moderate workload, and not an intense workload. I'll just say this is more moderate. Really light, light, and medium. Put it that way. Now, for each of these workloads... They're conducted in three different temperatures, neutral, warm, and hot, 27, 37, and 40. And the difference between 37 and 40 doesn't seem to be very much, but it's enough that it's compensable heat stress versus uncompensable heat stress. So this is a fairly shocking step to make, even though it's only three degrees. Now, what we're looking for in each case is where this line intersects each of these bars. Each of these bars is meant to represent the total amount of energy needed to do this work. It's not the amount of work. The amount of work is down here, just under 400 watts, 420 watts, almost 500 watts in that first column. This is percentage distribution. So the entire box is 100% of the work. In this first example on the far left hand side, there's just over 80% coming from aerobic metabolism and just under 20% coming from anaerobic metabolism or substrate level phosphorylation. And the reasons for that are not clear right now, but what we're concerned with is how it changes over time. As we warm, regardless of the intensity, this box shifts downwards. And that shift downwards simply means there's a larger percentage attributed to anaerobic metabolism as the ambient temperature goes up, regardless of workload. Higher temperature, more um, anaerobic ATP produced. So we don't know why that is yet, but we know that anaerobic ATP production goes up in the heat. It might actually be related to this next point that we're going to talk about. So aerobic oxidation, uh, aerobic, um, aerobic metabolism um, tends to contribute less energy. Anaerobic metabolism tends to contribute more energy to accomplish these workloads as heat goes up. 
The third thing that we notice about exercise in the heat is that we use more carbohydrates. We use more carbohydrates. We shift away from using fat towards carbohydrates, and this is regardless of intensity. As heat goes up, our reliance on carbohydrates also goes up. Let's take a look at how we might um, know that or explain that. This is a really interesting study that I purposefully removed one of the bars here um, because it doesn't impact our understanding of um, carbohydrate use in the heat. But we're coming back to the study when we talk about dehydration. This is a really brilliant study design that used um, trained cyclists had them exercise, and they got dehydrated. Then they recovered for four hours while drinking fluids. So essentially, they should be in the same condition. They should be as well hydrated as they were when they started. And then they exercised in a hot or a neutral environment. So what we're not looking at is the fluid recovery portion. That's the bar that I've hidden here. We don't care about that right now. What we care about is... Of the individuals that were well hydrated, how much glycogen did they use if they exercised in a normal temperature, in a neutral environment, versus how much glycogen they used in the heat? And there's a pretty clear difference where during an exercise test in the heat, they used 50%, 40% more glycogen just because the temperature was higher. As before, this is 25 degrees in a normal temperature. Like I mentioned here, uh, I didn't mention there. 25 degrees normal temperature, 33, 36 degrees in the heat. Not the same kind of stress as we saw before, 43 degrees, but still hot versus neutral. So this is uh, an exercise test. After all this was said and done, and we're only looking at the amount of glycogen used, it's higher in the heat. The only difference is the heat. So because it was hot, they used more glycogen. What are the implications of this? When we were checking off the list of things that often happen with fatigue, we had high heart rate, means fatigue. Low pressure, means fatigue. High temperature, means fatigue. Low glycogen always happens with fatigue, or usually happens with fatigue as well. So the implication of this is that if you use more glycogen in a hot environment, You'll run out of glycogen faster. Therefore, you'll reach critical low glycogen levels sooner and be more likely to fatigue. This is another reason why exercise in the heat might complicate performance or undermine performance. We don't exactly know why this is the case. It's a really interesting thing to think about. Why would heat make you use more glycogen? Why would heat make you use more carbohydrate? Why would heat make you rely more on anaerobic glycolysis? One potential answer or explanation for this is what we call the, the law of mass action, which you can think of as metabolic inertia or metabolic flow. Um, if I were to, well, you know the principle of inertia. If um, a body in motion tends to stay in motion. If something has mass, it's really hard to slow it down. So if there's flux through a pathway, it's hard to stop that flux. 
if there's flux through a pathway, it keeps going. What we think happens is in the heat, glycolysis is just more active. In the heat, molecules move around more freely. Remember, heat is just movement of molecules, right? Enzymes can get their substrates more easily. Enzymes can do their reactions more easily. And so if glycolysis is more active, glycogen supplies glycolysis. So that helps to explain why glycogen use is higher in the heat. And glycolytic flux is substrate level phosphorylation. It is anaerobic glycolysis. So it's possible that it's just a side effect of being hot, molecules moving around more, being more fluid, metabolism being more active, that we use more glycogen and we end up relying more on substrate level phosphorylation that we saw in point two. And I'll come back to this when we get to class on Thursday, but the end point of glycolysis is lactate. And so if you have all of these metabolites spilling through glycolysis, it's going to overflow at the end. One of the other factors that we see is lots of lactate being produced in the muscle. Again, this could simply be because of the law of mass action, this inertia. There's a lot of flow through glycolysis. We end up producing more lactate, using more glycogen, relying more on anaerobic glycolysis. So I'll come back to this when we get to class on Thursday. I hope that didn't confuse things for you. I know that we talked sort of off, off book or off slide a little bit. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I will see you um, on Thursday. Thank you.